Well, it's that time again this week, all right? Everybody bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to worship the Lord. Uh, again, thank you for your prayers, your texts, and your calls. Uh, they mean a lot to us. It's, I feel those, we feel those. Uh, Madison's at Vanderbilt uh, with Allison. I came home, and then we're going to swap again. So we're getting closer to getting an answer, but just keep praying for us. Uh, she's in a good place right now. A lot of specialists and stuff and um, we took her last Sunday to Corinth and our good friend Holly took care of everything and gave her the best care up there and then we knew we needed to take her to Vanderbilt so she's in a good spot right now but just keep praying for us as we go through this during this time okay let's talk about church okay um, if you're visiting with us this morning there'll be some guys come down the aisle with some visitor cards if you see a visitor around you tell them hi that's your job Love on them. Let them know that you're glad that they're here. I'm going to ask everybody to stand and go around and greet each other.
Welcome to First Baptist Towns. We welcome you. Welcome to church. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sunday School Class at First Baptist Towns. Welcome to church. We're so glad you're here this morning. Come, be our friend. You are very welcome, wanted, and desired. Welcome to church. The Queens love you. Good morning. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you came to join us for worship. Let's worship together. We invite you to come and be a part of our worship. Let's worship. excited this morning. Um, as you can see, we have some special guests up on the stage with me this morning. All of our little kiddos. Say hi, kiddos. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm really excited for, I love when kids worship with us. We were talking about it this morning. The most pure form of worship comes from children. Uh, they're just up here and they just sing their little hearts out and they just smile and it is a treat to me. I know that the Lord loves it, and I'm excited this morning. Um, we're excited to sing. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whosoever may believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So if you would like to stand with me this morning, I would love to worship with you right now.
Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today just so thankful that we get this opportunity, Lord, to just come together and collectively worship you, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord, that died on the cross, Lord, that, so that you called us out of those graves, Lord, and so that one day we can walk in the garden with you. Lord, I just pray that as we continue to worship, Lord, that you put your hand on this service, Lord. Bless Brother Jimmy and the message that he brings. I pray all this in your holy name. Amen. What you say? 
thank all the kids and the bigger kids that were helping out this morning. So beautiful to see these children uh, worship the Lord and it reminds me of our great week of VBS that we have when they come in here excited and we're putting down a 
pot of coffee trying to get a little bit excited with them. But uh, it's good to see the different generations we have worshiping in the church. That's what it's meant to be. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about being patient while you wait. Being patient while you wait. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 22 and 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And if you didn't bring a copy of the scriptures, you can take that black pew Bible and you can turn to page 150 in the New Testament. And you will be right there where we're at. It's a very familiar passage that we have. And as you're turning that way, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, raise your hand if you're saved. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand. Now keep them up for a second. Do you know that once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living inside? You say, I'm getting y'all to get charismatic this morning. You got your arms up. Some of you got two. Okay. But you know, you can put your arms down. Now raise them back up. Simon says, drop them. Okay. But you know, when you get saved, at the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. That's the promise that Jesus gave us. Well, us Baptists, we're a little, we're a little um, uh, suspicious of the Holy Spirit. We, we think it's more charismatic, than, but it's very important. It's part of the Trinity. It's, it's what God said that he was going to send us as a helper to guide us and direct us. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is it gives us the fruit of the Spirit. So when you get to Galatians chapter 5, you see that the spirit versus the flesh. Paul's talking about this war that wages inside of us because the flesh, yes, you are a new creation, but the flesh still lives inside of you. And the spirit, now that you're saved, is also in there. And those two are fighting. They're they're having a war. And whatever one you feed the most is the one that's going to prosper the most. So if you're feeding the flesh, that's how you're going to act. And Paul says that the acts of the flesh, the works of the flesh... Our sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, uh, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. He says, so if you're operating in the flesh, that's what's going to be the product coming out of those things. Now, since probably 99 to 100 percent of you raised your hand saying you are saved, I'm going to talk about what that looks like or should look like. Okay, so if you'd stand with me, we're going to read verses 22 and 23. All right? It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We'll stop there. Because that's both verses. Did you catch all that? What you're supposed to do? You're to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. All those are a chain linked together. They're not separate. They're all one thing. So let's pray over this, and we'll get started this morning. Lord, thank you so much that uh, your word teaches us and your Holy Spirit guides us. I pray this morning, whatever anybody's going through this morning, uh, we all go through situations where we need to wait on you and learn to be patient during those times. Uh, Help us to do that. And it's only done through your spirit. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. There's a lot of people who have faithfully attended church for many years. Many of you have been baptized. If you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. Does that save you? No, it doesn't save you. But it's your first act of obedience, and you need to be obedient to that. And you've heard, many of y'all have heard a lot of sermons. And yet you are struggling with how to live the Christian life. It can't be lived on the outside. It's got to be lived from the inside out. And the way we do that is through the Holy Spirit. It's not accomplished by self-effort. A lot of people think that they can make themselves better. I hear this. You've heard this story, too, when you tell somebody, you know, you need to come join the church. You need to come to church. And they say, well, I got a lot of mess in my life right now. I can't do it. When I clean myself up, then I'll come. You know how that works out. Doesn't work out very good because that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to stay outside. Uh, if you watch these nature movies, the, the uh, deer or the wildebeest or whatever that's outside of the herds, that's the one the lions go after. That's the easiest prey because they're outside, and that's what the devil does. He looks for the one that's outside of the group, and he attacks them. But it, the only way to live the Christian life is to be completely reliant on the Holy Spirit as he lives through you. That's with purpose. Jesus told the disciples in that room, he, he says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to have the power to do things 
that you can't do on your own. You're going to be able to stay in situations that seem impossible. You're going to be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of the death and hold your head up high knowing your Lord's with you because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. We, I heard people say all the time, don't pray for patience because you know what that means. You're going to get tested. Well, God wants you to develop patience because you see a lot of bad decisions we make are based on not being patient enough waiting on the Lord. Um, this, this past week, we were trying to make a decision of where to take Madison. And I had my phone was blowing up. And people were saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it was all helpful. I'm not, I'm not upset at that. But I just needed to get quiet with the Lord because I was like, I'm, this is a big decision. We need to know where to go. And so I just got quiet with him. We were supposed to take her back to Chattanooga to the hospital where she had originally gone. And I just didn't have peace about it. And I said, Lord, I said, just give me some signs. And so about quickly right after that, I get a text that says, uh, for what my two cents is worth, this is one of our medical providers, she, had, she says, she needs to go to Vanderbilt. And then somebody else said, you know, I've been, I've been praying about this, and I feel like Vanderbilt's where you need to go. God instantly answered that prayer when I got quiet and I got still. I just waited. Sometimes he answers instantly. Sometimes he waits a little while. And what he's trying to do some of the times when he wants you to wait and be patient, he's wanting you to see what you want is not what he wants. And so he's slowly moving you in that way. Don't ever get the idea that you need to rush because he didn't say anything. I need to hurry up and make a decision because a lot of times we, we regret that. But one of the Spirit's jobs is to provide guidance that we need throughout life. And there are times we got to be patiently waiting. And that is no fun. I'm here to tell you, it's no fun to wait patiently. But we're called on that because when we do that, God is going to reveal to us if we're seeking his will on that. If we're closing out all the voices that we're hearing, um, we will hear him reveal to us what his will is for us. Waiting patiently is not easy. I say that again. It is not easy. But you have the power to do that, okay? It doesn't come naturally. Where does it come from? We just read in Galatians chapter 5. It's a gift of the Spirit. And when you think of the fruit, it's not fruits. It's fruit. And you think of an orange, that when you peel open an orange, you've got different uh, pieces of the orange that peel off. Different, I don't know what you call those things, but uh, whatever. Uh, but you peel those things off, and the, but it's still an orange. It's not oranges. It's just petals of coming off the orange. Well, that's the way the fruit of the Spirit is. You have this petal is love. This one is joy. This one is peace. So as you open that up, the Holy Spirit has got all those things inside of you. Some of you are not joyful, but you're saved, and you should be joyful. Some of you don't have peace, but if you're saved, you should have peace. Some of you aren't very kind, but you should be if you're saved because you have that gift inside of you. Some of you are gentle, and that's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. He gives that gentle gift to be able to minister, and you do a good job at that. Patience doesn't come naturally, as I said, but it is a gift. It's essential that we cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he develops patience within us. Nothing comes overnight except salvation. After that, we're a work in progress. Um, I like to watch these home fixer-up shows where they, they go in and, and we were watching a bunch of those in the hospital room where they would take this old, old house and, you know, these, these old um, front, not frontier, but what do they call the old historic ones that were built in 1800, and they would go in there and kind of gut them and, and make them modern, and it was just beautiful to watch. When you first saw the house, you're like, oh, what a mess. That's the way the Lord looks at us when we first get saved. He says, oh, we got a lot of work to do here, especially with this guy. We got to start from the head to the toes, fixing the mind, fixing the mouth, fixing the heart, fixing the hands, the feet to make action happen. This can save us if we develop this patience through the Holy Spirit. It can save us from certain regrets. A lot of the regrets we have is because we made a rush decision to do something that we thought the Lord, we tried to convince ourselves, the Lord wants me to have this. And we pay for it. There's consequences to that. And if you think over your life, what's the biggest regret that you have? It's probably because you never prayed over it. 
you didn't ask for his will. You decided, this is what I'm going to do, and God will come along and he'll bless this. Well, there's an old saying that God doesn't bless our mess. You get into a mess, God's not going to bless it. He's going to let you suffer for a little bit and learn a lesson. So hopefully next time you will go to him instead of you going to yourself or going to someone else. So being patient is very, very important. And scripture talks about this all over. Book of Psalms says this. In Psalm 27, 14, it says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him and do not fret. How many of y'all are fretting? How many of y'all are patient? Let's go with that one. Two, four, three, four. Wow. We got some work to do, right? I didn't raise my hand, so I'm right there with you. It's hard to be patient. But, you know, a lot of the stress we put on ourselves is self-inflicted because we're not patient. We're not waiting on God to, to take care of things. You know, patience can be defined in several ways. This is what one of the dictionaries says. It is a quiet, uncomplaining endurance under stress or annoyance. Let me read that again. Because when you read the fruit of the Spirit, none of it was complaining. It says that patience is quiet uncomplaining endurance under stress or annoyance. Another one is being good-tempered. And here's my favorite definition because I like to keep things simple. Having the will to wait. That's what patience is, having the will to wait. And there's all things that come into our life that we need to wait on at times. We need to make sure this is God's path for us. Why do we need patience is the first point here today. Why do we need patience? What good is patience? There are times when we've got to make decisions, but we don't know what to do. Those come up all the time for many of us. And we need to wait and see what the Lord. You say, well, do I have to pray about everything? That's what he tells us to. The small decisions and the big decisions, to pray about those things. If God gives you a check in your spirit and, and says, ah, 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 and you know that, you hear that going on inside of you. And he's saying, that's not the right person. That's not the right situation. This isn't the right job. This isn't the right thing you need to be doing. And you go, hmm, I want to do it anyway. Well, that's what Galatians is talking about. You have the flesh and you have the spirit, and they're fighting constantly against each other. And God will tell you sometimes, no, that's not easy to take. Especially because we try and take scripture and twist it a little bit. You know, we'll take, we'll go to Proverbs or we'll go to Psalms and we'll say, well, you know, that scripture that says that God wants to give me the desires of my heart. Well, this is a desire of my heart. Well, the he wants to give you the desires of your heart that line up with his will for you. There's some things that you want that he doesn't want for you to have because he knows it's not the best thing for you. He knows what's going to happen on down the road. But most of us don't like to wait. We can't be patient. We're reluctant to delay any decision. We want God to act on our timetable. God, you need to answer this now. I need an answer right now. And if you don't answer it, I'm just going to decide what to do. And I heard one preacher one time on TV talking, and he says, when you get saved, any decision you make is God's will because the Spirit's living inside of you. Mm. I don't believe that. I, I think we can look at the Bible and see Abraham and, and Sarah, decision that was made. I believe we can look at David. We can look in our lives, and we can see that we've made mistakes, and we have regrets from those mistakes because we went ahead and we didn't wait on God to act in his timetable. You know, it's been said that the devil will always show you his best before God shows you his. And sometimes he'll put something out there that you think is really tempting, that, that is perfect for you. And God is saying, you can take that if you want, but I've got something much better for you. If you'll just wait and let me work all these things out. See, there's all kinds of wheels in motion behind the scenes we don't see. We get that in the book of Job where God's saying, Job, you don't understand anything. But I'm working all kinds of things. You don't understand how I feed the animals. You don't understand how I hold the waters back. You don't understand where the storms, where I store hell, how I make the rains. You don't understand how I feed the birds, how I take care of all these things. That's baby stuff. You just need to understand who I am and trust me. 
And that's what patience is. It's trusting in who God is, that he'll always take care of it. Remember, we talked about the Lord being omniscient. And what that means, he's all-knowing. He knows the troubles that are going to come into your life, and he knows the best way to take care of those things. He cares about you so much, and he's involved in every circumstance that you will go through. And he knows that if you will wait, he will eventually reveal his will to you and show you. Who is your greatest protector? You know, I was sitting here thinking about, you know, uh, what can I, you feel helpless when your kid's sick. And, and, you know, you feel helpless when you see other children sick or see someone sick and there's nothing you can do. And God just reminded me during this time, I got it. I don't need you, but I got it. You just trust in me, you be patient and let me work all this out. I say, look, but God, I need to, I need, you know, and I'm trying, trying to make excuses. This is what, you know, and God's like, shh. It's not fun to be shushed by God. It's not fun to be shushed by anybody. But that's what he says. He says, Jimmy, calm down. I love you and I love your family. I've got the best intentions for them. Trust me. Let me work this out. Don't run ahead of me. He created us to live for him, to serve him, and reflect him. So, if what we desire doesn't fit the purpose or the timing, it would be foolish to be impatient and rush into that. And that's where many of our regrets come from. When he says no, he's not rejecting you, he's protecting you. Okay? When he says no, I'm going to say that again. When he says no, he's not rejecting you, he's protecting you. He's your greatest protector. And a, long, a lot of times we'll look back and we'll go, well, I'm glad that prayer didn't get answered. I'm glad he saved me from that situation. I thought that was going to be the deal at the time, but whoo, that would have been a mess. I remember a church that I was looking at that was uh, wanting to call me to, be, to come serve there. And I thought, well, this is going to be great. And I go up to Oklahoma. It was in Norman, Oklahoma, out of all the places. I don't like OU, but it was right next to the stadium the church was. And it was a big church. It, it, I mean, I was going to be in control of the Sunday school and small groups. And I just thought, this is, this is it. And I walk in, and I hated Norman, you know. I, I just, uh, I didn't like that. Not that I hate people from Oklahoma. I just, because of the football rivalry, it just got a natural distaste in my mouth for them. And I go into that church, and the pastor comes in, and he's, he's talking to me, and, and they've got like 15 people on staff, and he introduces me to the education minister and discipleship minister. I'm taking his place. And he says, yeah, we've had some discussions, and uh, he's decided to step aside into another position in the church. I said, hmm, okay. And so... I went to the interview with the, with the committee, and they're all frowning. I mean, they're just, they're, they don't want me there. And I'm thinking, but this is a good opportunity, God. I see, you know, I see your will in this, and God is, you know, tapping me on the shoulder the whole time going, you better run from this place. Don't you dare stay here. And so they, they go over, over everything, and they're asking me questions, and I'm trying to explain, and this one committee member's just sitting there. And they go, and she finally speaks up, and she goes, you know, if you take this job, John loses his. I went, I got it. I said, I didn't know that until I came here. But it's a good opportunity. Maybe John's not doing his job. Come on, Lord, make this happen. Allison and I go back to the hotel. She looks at me. She goes, we need to get on the plane. ASAP. This place is a bomb getting ready to go off. Well, I get home. They, they call and they say, you know, you're, you're, you're it for us. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but um, I'm going to stay in South Georgia at this time. I, I just don't feel that. Two weeks later, they fired the pastor. He got caught in some stuff. They fired him. If I would have gone on and not listened to God checking my spirit saying, hey, this is not the situation. Even though the money looks good, the opportunity looks good, all these things, I would have walked right into a mess. 
thankfully I listened. There's been other times, I'm, I'll be honest, there's been other times I hadn't listened to him. He's told me things not to do, not to go ahead and do, and I've done them and had regrets over those things. That's part of life, learning from those. If you don't learn from those mistakes, then you're, you're not paying attention. So again, when God says no, he's not rejecting us, he's protecting us. And to be benefit from his loving protection, you need to consult him in everything. Houses, cars, all those things. Does God want you to run a credit card up? No. Does God want you to buy a car that you can't afford? No. Does God want you to get into a relationship that he hasn't blessed? No. Does God want you to bail out of a relationship because you're having struggles and you haven't sought him, you haven't lived the godly life that he's asked you to, to live? No. You do everything that you can in those situations, listening to God the whole time, because he will tell you that's not a good idea. But if we insist on having it our own way, you are headed for trouble. I'm telling you, you are headed for trouble. The opposite's true. When you're patient, he, he calmly helps you tolerate the situation so you can get through and you can glorify him in your life. Patience helps you tolerate in those delays of his answers. That's why we need patience. Impatient results in the following mistakes. Assumption. If God delays in answering our request, we assume we can just go ahead. Well, if he's not going to answer, I'm going to make the decision. I'm just going to run ahead and go. Look out. Look out. You're going to get in trouble with that. Well, he didn't forbid it. He just didn't answer it. So that must mean that it's my choice to make. No, God's saying, he steps back for a minute and he's like, I know what you're thinking, but you better not do it. You have the free will to do it, but you better not do it. Misuse of scripture. At other times, like I said, we try to manipulate the word of God to answer our questions for us. We'll find, like I said, we search the Bible to support our desires. I told you about Psalm 37, 4 that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, Lord, this is what will delight me. God says, it's not what I want you to delight in. I want you to delight in me, and then you'll see the desires. You'll see me work through your life. As you live your life for Christ, and you let him use you, you'll find delight in your purpose and the plan that he has for your life. If you're miserable right now, it's because maybe you're out of his will. Maybe you're not living the purpose. Is, this, is everything inside the purpose for you going to be joyful? No. <laughs> it's not it rains on the, the good and the bad right that's what the Bible says uh, you're going to go through things that are hard but God is building you up building you spiritual muscles up and he's going to use those for a ministry in the future some of the deepest hurts that you have in your life are going to be some of the greatest victories that he's going to use for other people because you can't minister to somebody in a place where you haven't been those are the greatest teachers. Because, you, you know, when something happens, somebody will come up and, well, this is what I would have done. And they have no clue because, they, you know, they hadn't walked in your shoes. They hadn't been through that. Now, when you have somebody come up that has been through that, and they just put their arms around you and say, I know how you feel. You can connect with that. So... I don't want a ministry like that. I don't want to have hurts in my life where I can connect with people and have to share my grief over and over again. When you got saved, you died to self. And you told God to use you, that you're a vessel. And a vessel goes where he guides it and directs it for his time. God has given you the spirit of truth to guide you through all the messes of life. So when you're in a jam, or maybe you're in one of those right now, don't sow seeds of destruction by doing your own thing. Wait patiently for him to guide you. If God says to wait, it's because he loves you. You know, all parents we and grandparents, well, this is kind of an exclusion to grandparents because they don't do this all the time. But all parents will tell their kids at some time, don't do something. Now, grandkids have immunity. Mine did at my parents' house. They could do things that I never could do. They could break a glass table. They could spill stuff. They could do whatever they wanted to. They had immunity there. No spankings, none of that stuff. Now, when I was doing that, it was whippings and all that other stuff. But grandparents, they don't do that. Well, God is more like a parent. And when he tells you no, it's to protect you from doing those things. You know, you tell your kids, 
They, they come in with this candy that they're getting ready to get here in the next weekend. They got all this chocolate, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and they're ripping through those packages. You said, don't eat that tonight. Save some. Why? Because I'm going to eat it when you go to bed. <laughs> That's the real answer. That's the real answer. You know, when I was growing up, we, had, we were in a big neighborhood in, in Dallas, and, and my dad, he loved Snickers and stuff like that. So we would go out trick-or-treating with a group of friends, and then we'd come back and we'd change costumes and go out again to the same houses. <laughs> Got to think smart these days, folks. Got to be smart. So we'd come in and basically had a pillowcase. I didn't take a bag. I took a pillowcase. And, you know, if you drop one or two things, I, I just held it out still. That one, I was a future preacher in the making. I just held the offer and played out and said, no, that's not enough. Come on back with some more. What is required in order to live obediently and patiently? Number one is faith in God. We've got to believe that he will always give us the best advice and direct us because he promised to. He says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Now, what does that mean? It means he's with you wherever you are and that he won't let you wander off if you're listening to him. He's your shepherd, and he knows we get into trouble sometimes, but he will always bring you back if you're willing to listen to him. So faith in God is what's required to live obediently and patiently. The second is a spirit of obedience. It's one thing to hear the Spirit speak. It's another thing to obey. We sing that song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way. That's what God says. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. And if we're willing to obey God and wait patiently, he will guide us. Discernment of God's timing. This is very, very crucial because, as I said, we get into situations and we want to make a, a rash decision. If you are angry, don't make a decision then. <laughs> you always make bad decisions when you're angry. You're not thinking logically. Hence, cell phones, you get angry, I'm going to tell them what I think right now. And you pull that thing out and you start typing and, and five seconds after you send it, maybe you go, oops, can't take it back. And you know what happens? They screenshot that. They send it to about 50 other people and say, did you see what the preacher said to me? And next thing I know, that little one text is to three, 400 people showing at a moment that I didn't be patient and calm down and wait on the Lord to, to solve the situation. Maybe the person didn't even mean it. At the time, it just caught me wrong and I just let it fly. Or maybe you're in the house with your spouse that rhymes, kind of like Dr. Seuss. You're in the house with your spouse, and they do something or say something, and, and you just kind of, what was that? And all of a sudden, your wall goes up, and you're like, I'll tell you one thing. I'm about to get them back. Your spouse goes off. Didn't mean it the way you took it, but spouse goes over here, and next minute, you walk by, you kick the dog or the cat, and you kick them, and you walk on and go to bed. Spouse comes in the bedroom, you flip one way, they flip the other way. Walls up. All because of a misunderstanding. Instead of patiently going back in and saying, you know, you just said that, that wasn't very loving, or did you mean, and you'll hear the, the guy usually back up real quick, well, uh, hold on, hold on. I, I didn't mean that. I, I want to take that back and getting it settled right then. And what that does, it does a couple of things. One, it keeps the devil from getting his foot inside your, your marriage. Two, it gets that wall torn down that goes in between you because he knows how to do those things. Another way to have patience is love for God. Obedience to the Lord is proof that you love him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You will do those things for me. It shows our heart is bent towards him. It also shows that we're willing to wait as long as necessary. And that is no fun, to be on the part where you've got to wait for him. Impatience shows our lack of love for God. It shows that we love these other things or other people more. God, I need this. I want this. And I know you're telling me not to do this or you're just not answering. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And what that shows is you don't love God because you're not willing to listen and wait for him to answer you. So God shows you these things. Also courage. Sometimes it takes courage to obey God and wait patiently for him to direct your path. 
You may feel like you are in a desperate situation, that you've got to make a critical decision, but you haven't prayed about it. You just are ready to be done. And you say, God, if, if you don't answer this, I'm about to fall off the cliff on this situation. You know who's on the other side of the cliff? God. He's there. He's there to catch you. Be determined to wait. In Psalm 32, 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go, and I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Why is patience essential to experiencing God's best? It's essential because we must listen, obey, and at times give up our own personal desires and opinions to wait for his direction. It's being selfless, okay? Not being selfish. It's, it's giving your life over to him doing those things. It's essential to building good relationships with other people. A lot of the friction that we have with other people is because we're not patient. <laughs> Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why haven't you done that? I can't believe it's taken this long. Why haven't you done, you know, and all these things, it's because you're not patient. What patience does is it gives grace to overlook wrongs. That's what we need because we all mess up. It's essential because timing is very important. The Holy Spirit will give us clear direction, but not always immediately. As I said, he's waiting for you to bend towards him and listen to him. And if you truly treasure God's wisdom, you'll wait patiently for him to reveal his will. It's essential to see God work in this situation. You ever gone through something and, and you didn't know what to do? You were waiting on God, and he does something that you didn't expect and fixes the problem or, or takes care of the situation, and you go, wow. That is so cool because he knew what was coming in the future, okay? He knew I needed this part of my life healed first because this other was coming. And so he fixed this first that I didn't think he was going to fix. And then <laughs> this mess comes, but I was prepared because I was grounded because he had already prepared me for what's going on. So we love to look back and see how he worked things out. God saved us for his purpose and will give us guidance if we ask for it. Okay? God is always right on time. We don't like that. We want to rush him. We're the ones whose timing is off a lot of times. So I close with this. Would your family, friends, co-workers describe you as a patient person? When I'm sleeping, I'm patient, right? Would they describe you as a patient person? Are you impatient? Always wound up. Always got to have things your way. Always got to, you know, just always stressed out because you're impatient. Well, you need to learn the fruit of being patient. How does your character and your conduct and your conversation show people? Does it show that you are a patient person or an impatient person? Now, there are certain circumstances, like when you go to the driver's license place, that it's okay to be impatient because sometimes, you know, you have problems there. I've heard about those things, you know. I hadn't experienced those, but sometimes they happen there. What kind of thoughts cause you to be impatient? What sets you off? What's your trigger point? Work on that. Because God wants you to be patient. Okay? That's what I got for you today. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, and gentleness, and self-control. Those are all go together. Work on your patience this week. Wait on God if you're looking for an answer in your life. Let's all stand. You remember what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will guide and direct your paths. Great passage to know, okay? As they get ready to sing here, our invitation, if you want to join the church, you're welcome to join the church. If you want to come pray, opportunity to pray. Um, maybe you need to pray for patience this morning. Ask God for wisdom in a situation that you're waiting on an answer for. Let's bow our heads. Father, again, we thank you for the gift that you've given us. And we know that we are impatient people. We're used to quick responses. 
whether it's somebody working on our houses or our cars or something we're at the store, we want service. Help us to be patient, patient people, because that shows you living through us. We struggle with impatience. Help us to get better at that. There's things in our life that trigger us, Lord. Help us to stay away from those things that do that. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Staff will be down front.